the wake thickness is about the same for both of these devices, and the wake thickness is basically the description of, of, the, of the drag. Okay, here we have an aircraft that's manipulating the boundary layer. In this case, it's, uh, it's intended to ingest the boundary layer on the afterbody and energize the boundary layer and uh, accelerate it with a fan. And uh, there, the original estimates were a 10% fuel economy improvement for this airplane. They found a mistake, and it's closer to 2 or 3%, which is probably aligned with your, what you might intuitively <coughs> expect. This is a NASA project that Al Bowers might make, probably will be familiar with. Okay, and by the way, the boundary layer uh, on the afterbody of this aircraft, uh, a typical boundary layer on, on an airplane that you see out here might be two or three inches, uh, an inch or so, two inches thick. A boundary layer here is uh, 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 you know, over a yard, a meter, uh, half a meter thick going into that. Okay, so now uh, in, lieu of, in lieu of applying methods to mitigate the energy lost due to the boundary layer, the wandering albatross exploits the boundary layer to provide 100% of its power for flight. The, uh, the, the wandering albatross circumnavigates Antarctica several times per year, flying for free on shoulder locked wings using dynamic soaring, uh, climbing upwind, and then turning and descending downwind. It gains energy each time. It gains enough energy by having a high aspect ratio wing, which reduces its boost drag. And here's where I'm going to have to probably try to get some help because I need to exit this and use the other mouse. This is available at my website. It is a, it's an executable. So if you try to visit my website and try to download it, your computer will try to protect you. <laughs> it's entirely safe. It's entirely safe. There's nothing except a computation of a trajectory going on here. OK, so let me see if I can maximize it. And this was written uh, 13 years ago. Go ahead, with Visual Basic. And so you have to, to run it, if you want to run it, you have to load the, uh, the uh, older um, graphics library. This is all explained in, at my website. It will not interfere with your new graphics library. Are we seeing what you're seeing, Phil? No, thank you. OK, the albatross, believe it or not, I'm wondering albatross and many of its relatives, uh, giant petrel and the, uh, the royal albatross, are able to fly in any direction, up, in any direction without flapping its wings. It can actually point upwind and say, "I want to go upwind." And the way it progresses upwind is by snaking, uh, and keeping itself very low. Let's, let's go ahead and do. Uh, let's go ahead and do uh, a downwind. The most typical maneuver, which is the one that the albatross uses, you have to click the type, say OK, and then you have to click fly. OK. So the wind is out of the screen, and the albatross is traveling downwind, it's spiraling downwind. It thinks it's flying in a circle, but when you, when you it's flying in a, a tilted zoom circle. <clears throat> but when, when you superimpose on that the wind, you get a spiraling trajectory, and it travels around the year flying for hours on end, just like this, several times per year around Antarctica. And this is an interactive uh, simulation to some extent. It's, everything's being, whoops. Okay. Runtime error. Everything is being calculated real time, and uh, in fact, some kind of the real time calculations can be responsible for the thing going unstable, so, which is apparently just did. Okay. All right, so now let's go back to the PowerPoint. Let's see if I can do that myself. So we did the albatross. Okay. Airfoil and wing. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's an airfoil. And uh, we have the vortices uh, that, uh, that the boundary layer represents. And you can think of these, each of these little vortices uh, as, a, as a ball bearing. Your, your PowerPoint's not back up. You're looking at your screen. You can go to slideshow. presentation mode. OK, I'm not in the slideshow. Thank you. Right. Which is function shift F5. Oh, thank yeah. you. And your name again is? Richie. Thanks, Richie. OK. Each of those uh, can be thought of as a, as a ball bearing, and each ball bearing affects all the rest. And, and the numerical calculation can solve for the strength of those, and that's been done on this next uh, slide here. Uh, this happens to be a Wortman airfoil, and uh, the, uh, the blue lines are the calculation, and the symbols are the test data. And uh, for this particular angle of attack and this particular airfoil, I couldn't ask for a better agreement than, than what you see here. For, this is the velocity. The vortex density is really nothing more than the velocity ratio. So it says that the velocity is going to about 60% greater than the, the flight velocity at the top over the top of the airfoil. 
Another interesting phenomenon is that the, at the trailing edge, the velocity is about 90% of flight velocity. And uh, the geometry is very efficiently characterized with, uh, with uh, uh, only a handful of nodes. Uh, in this case, it takes about 15 nodes to describe an existing airfoil. And you can actually design a new airfoil with, uh, with perhaps 10 nodes using a cubic spline interpolation versus the cloud anchor for the z coordinate. And here's for some boundary layer phenomenon. The boundary, notice how the boundary layer, the, the momentum thickness is only one tenth of one percent of the thickness of the airfoil. So very, very thin boundary layer. And that's one of my Excel programs that you can have, that you can use upon request. And it helps all sorts of airfoils. There are tabs at the bottom, and you can pick any one of those and click run, and you can copy it and edit it to design your own airfoil. Uh, it is limited to linear flight. It is, it is not do CL max. Okay, drag to the lift, leading edge thrust. Now this is, uh, this is where the, the presentation will go uh, uh, quite technical, temporarily. <coughs> For those of you who do not want to see any equations, close your eyes, take a deep breath and relax. <laughs> <laughs> and then we will get back uh, to, the, to, the, to the more fun stuff. But this is really fundamental. This is a fairly new discovery on my part. It, it puts together, uh, it, it, it sort of sprung from uh, Several, uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of, of mentoring several <coughs> engineering groups doing their capstone projects at university. So there might be a typically a group of four or five students, and they need an engineer at North of Grumman or, Bach or Boeing or Lockheed to, to guide them through their project. And so I've, I've done that for a number of projects. One of the projects was that, 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 I, that we get to invent, and the students do the research and the wind tunnel test. This one sprung from my concept or my notion that the drag to the lift would get worse and worse as an airfoil gets thinner and thinner for a flat, uncambered airfoil. And so the objective was for the students to build several models of various weight thickness and test them in their wind tunnel. And they, they did confirm that uh, result. And uh, I will show you my own confirmation. But a lot of the, lot of the, the uh, presentation that I made, many of the technical papers I've written have uh, benefited incredibly from the collaboration with, with the students. So, so the, the students learn and the instructor learns when you get that collaboration. Okay, leading edge thrust, uh, uh, AKA leading edge suction. Thrust is a more appropriate term in my, in my opinion. It was the term used by Robert T. Jones, famous Mac at Aerodynamicist. And where does that come from? Okay, here's an airfoil and here's the CDO drag, drag at the zero left. So it's so over, over a wide range of, of, of uh, angle of attack, the friction drag is about the same. So that's almost a fixed number. So, uh, here's a flight velocity in, in what I'm calling gamma, which is geometric incidence of the equivalent flat plate. So I'm taking the, any airfoil that's maybe the camera or uncamered and making it the equivalent flat plate, okay? And that's the, at the geometric incidence called gamma. <clears throat> Whether the airfoil is thick or thin, it's going to generate a normal force, which is typically called CM, normal force coefficient, which at low speed, in low speed flight, would be 2 pi times gamma. Now that doesn't matter whether we're thick or thin, we're going to get that normal force that you see like that. Now, if the airfoil is a perfect airfoil, in other words, it's a relatively thick airfoil, and, and uh, it's going to generate a leading edge thrust. Well, now why is that? Because the, air, the stagnation point will be down here. The flow accelerates up over the nose of the airfoil and, and to incredibly high velocities, and it generates a tremendous amount of suction. And that suction acting on that projected area ends up making thrust. That thrust is aligned with the cord, and so it's quite reasonable to call it thrust because that thrust is perfectly, often perfectly aligned with engine thrust, which is aligned with the cord of the airflow. So we're going to call it leading edge thrust, and about half of the literature uh, uses that term. The other half of the literature uses leading edge suction. They're all the same topic. But what you're going to see here is a new interpretation. Okay, so now, um, if I have the really good airfoils, uh, then I end up with an overall pressure integration vector, which happens to be vertical. In horizontal flight, I end up with a vertical vector. So the pressure integration vector coincides with the lift only for the perfect airfoil. Now let's look what happens when you have a very thin airfoil. Over here we have very thin. We get a tremendous amount of suction on the leading edge, but there's no area. There's no area to act on. And so, the normal force vector becomes what we get, okay? Well, you can see that that normal force vector is now tilted aft, and so without being tilted aft, it means that we are having a drag 
which is essentially with small angles, a small angle approximation for trigonometry here, that drag is going to be gamma CL, gamma C, because the CL, the lift coefficient, is very, very close to the normal force coefficient with it for small angles. And so this, this drag, this red vector here, becomes a drag, which is gamma CL. And that's what you're going to get for a very thin. So what we have here is we have the best case on the left, worst case on the right. Let's look at a more typical case. The more typical case or the usual case is, we, is we're somewhere in between those two limits. And so we're going to introduce a term called phi, representing the fraction of worst case drag. <clears throat> so phi will go from zero for a really good airfoil to one for a thin flat uh, airfoil. So here's all the arithmetic behind that. But the bottom line is that we get something like this. We get that the drag of the airfoil is CDO, there's a drag of zero lift, plus a term times CO squared. So uh, those of you who, who, uh, who are familiar with airfoils know that the airfoil uh, drag versus lift is typically characterized as a polar, and very often the CL versus CD is a parabola. And this formula is a parabola. So the, to the extent that your airfoil drag polar is a parabolic, a parabola, this formula is actually uh, repeating that, that phenomenon, and that means that phi is essentially constant. So phi for a given airfoil is, is, is to the extent that there's a parabola going on there, a polar, uh, phi is a constant for a given airfoil. Let's see, like he, let's see what that looks like. Here's some of the actual data. This is versus Mach number. This is from a, uh, a, NACA, a series of NACA papers, <coughs> and um, we calculated then what phi had to be for the, for the, for the data. And uh, what you see here is we have thicknesses ranging from two. Uh, there's a thickness of zero, by the way, and of course, with a thickness of zero, the phi is one, which means that you get the full, the full fraction of drag. And then as we increase the thickness, two, four, six, nine, and 12 percent, we drop that, that drag falls to, towards zero for a very, very thick airfoil. But even, even a 12 percent thick airfoil like this is not going to achieve perfection, but it will be near perfection. So you guys, uh, uh, for the airplanes out here, are interested in, in right over here, because this is Mach number, and that's Mach, low Mach number. And by the way, an interesting phenomenon that, that came out of this was that anything above Mach 0.95, uh, the uh, phi is 1, which means that, the, the, which means that the, for any airfoil transonic Mach 0.9, the, the, the force vector stands normal to the core, period. Okay, four body. Max Monk, one of the, uh, probably arguably the most um, eccentric of parental protégés. Max Monk, of course, worked for the Germans in World War I as a young man, and he was deservedly proud of his technical papers. He was so proud of his technical papers that he made sure that each new paper he wrote was leaked across the channel to the British before it could be stamped secret by the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> After World War I, Max Monk came over to the United States, and he, tr and he was uh, hired to run uh, NACA, or the pre predecessor of NACA. And, uh, but his personality problems were, uh, uh, were too severe for that. He was too, um, he was unable to, uh, he was actually a brilliant third aerodynamicist, a brilliant theorist, but he was not good with, this, with the people skills, so that didn't work out very well. But anyway, he's a uh, very, very uh, legacy he left for us for, for thin airfoil theory, as well as airship uh, phenomena. And he studied airships, and he showed us that the lift uh, of a full body is not proportional to the platform area looking down like a wing. The lift of a full body is proportional to the square of the span B. So that's a fundamental result for full body lift. And uh, I went and extended that to calculate where is the lift acting, depending on this function of shape. And as you vary the shape, um, this is, these are my own calculations of where the aerodynamic center is for these. Uh, 5 fifteenths of the nose length, 8 fifteenths and 10 fifteenths, depending on the shape of the uh, And so if you're laying out an airplane and you want to know where the aerodynamic center of the airplane is, you have to include the full body effect, which tends to destabilize the airplane in pitch. And if you're talking about yaw, the airplane is destabilized in yaw because now you're looking at the side of the airplane, the side of the fuselage, the four body destabilizes the airplane in yaw. And that's not uh, it's often a significant contributor. Okay, um, now we have Robert T. Jones, who did a parallel independent study 20 years later, 30 years later, of low aspect ratio wings. And the fascinating result is that he got the same result as Monk, 
looking at a, a, a low aspect ratio wing, <coughs> he shows that the lift is proportional to the span squared, not proportional to the platform area. Okay. Um, and um, Jones, uh, by the way, who was a student of Max Mux, and uh, had no formal degree, and went on to write several brilliant papers, classic NACA papers on aerodynamics. Um, <clears throat> he found that uh, Mach number has no effect. So, so if you have an airplane that's flying at faster and faster supersonic Mach numbers, the fin is losing effectiveness as you go faster and faster in Mach number. But the full body retains 100% of its subsonic effectiveness. And so the destabilizing effect is still there at Mach 2 and Mach 3. And in fact, one of our X planes, one of the, one of the NASA X planes, when it got to Mach 3, um, when it got to Mach 3, the destabilizing effect of the full body overshadowed the diminishing destabilizing effect of the fin, and the, and the pilot was killed, and the aircraft was destroyed. I think that was the X3, but I don't remember. Okay, so Mach number has no effect. This is, this is valid in any Mach number, and it's a very frequent mold. And also, Jones went, this, went beyond that uh, to uh, calculate the drag, and he calculated the drag, and we got a fascinating result. <laughs> now, working again, uh, with, with, working with the aspect ratio here, the fascinating result that, that the drag due to lift for this full body was the same as Prentice formula, sales squared over pi A. Fascinating result. Pi A is the aspect ratio. Phil, I'm, yes. so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Go ahead. for us laymen, the gray that we were looking at, what is the, because you, you showed be a span, but if that was a wing, it looked like a cord to me, so I'm Okay, gonna... all right, this is, a, uh, okay, good, thank you for asking, hey, don't, don't, don't hesitate to ask a question here, I want you to get the information here. This is an elliptical 4 by 8 with an elliptical cross section. That happens to be a view of a 4 by 8 a flattened, flattened 4 by 8 oh. okay? Um, let me go back to this one. You see the three dimensionality of these shapes? Okay. These guys are all developing lift when you put them in an annual attack. Okay, did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, I want to make sure that I communicate with you guys because uh, I'm not, not going to be able to cover everything uh, in the presentation given the technical problems of my. Uh, it's just when you, you said it was a wing, so when I, I saw yeah. that it was a wing and that looked like cord to me. Oh, you, okay. You didn't realize it was pointing forward instead of sideways. It's pointing forward. Yeah, it's a low aspect ratio wing. The wind direction is X. Pointing into the wind, yeah. Okay, so if you're pointing into the wind, and by the way, when, you, when the aspect ratio becomes really low, like my arm, the lift vector is almost right at the leading edge. Fascinating result. Okay, so, so there's a bunch of wings in the forms of four bodies, and uh, they destabilize the airplane in both pitch and yaw. Okay, now here we have a little big pranko with this famous elliptical wing. And once again, I'm, I'm, I'm reviewing, if you will, the, the uh, combination of, of angle of attack, <coughs> which is the, the cord line makes an angle of attack. The zeta is the angle, is a, is a zero lift uh, line, and we're, there's an increasing tendency, of increasing preference in the literature to treat that as a positive angle, zeta, if it's above the cord line. So it's, it's, not, the, it's not the zero lift angle, it's, a, it's an incidence of the zero lift line. If you add alpha plus zeta, we get gamma, which is the geometric incidence of the flat plate airflow. Okay, and that's what we're doing here. And for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be working with the equivalent of <coughs> flat plate airflow. So, so Prantl was uh, provided us with a around 1915 time frame, a pioneering uh, estimate of, of lift to drag. <coughs> and here's a calculation of, of, of the incidence here and the, the uh, lift. And the, the solid line is Prentel's calculation. And the symbols represent two, two wings tested uh, uh, two wings representing NASA test data, showing that the uh, pr uh, Prentice calculation is about 10% optimistic. <coughs> Nevertheless, he gave us a <coughs> pioneering estimate of the lift and how it's affected by aspect ratio. Okay, so uh, we have a, a Klaus Kleins, was a German aerodynamicist, and he went on to calculate, he did a calculation for a correction factor, and this is a correction factor to uh, Prentel's uh, formula for lift as the aspect ratio changes. Uh, we have uh, Heinrich Helmold did a calculation, lifting surface calculation instead of a lifting line, and by going to a lifting surface, we got Helmold's blue line, uh, which comes much closer to, to Prendel, than Prendel's green line to, to represent a large population of data. 
all from NACA, various NACA reports, unswept wing, and all of those line up with, with a, a Jones calculation for a low aspect ratio wing over there. Okay. Now here we have a very interesting test in the, in the wind tunnel. Um, I think this data was obtained around 1939, 1940. This is the young Albert Betts. Adolf Busman had calculated theoretical advantages of sweet and supersonic flight. But it was Albert Betts who was first to discover the benefits, empirically discover the benefits of, of sweet in subsonic flight. And so he contacted Adolf Busman and the two of them kind of patented the swept wing concept circa, circa 1940. Fascinating result here is that, is that these two wings, one swept and unswept, have the same aspect ratio and they have the same streamwise airflow. That's to be a NACA 12. And uh, the, uh, you can see that the swept wing outperforms uh, the unswept wing tremendously. Now, this is all highly exaggerated because we're looking at Mach 0.8. And what's happening at Mach 0.8 is that you really can't fly a Mach 0.8 with a thick wing like that. But for that particular set of conditions that were chosen, uh, it, it showed very dramatically a benefit. Um, a real benefit today uh, with, a, with a, a properly chosen airfoil will be only a few percent, but it's enough to be, keep it worth on the airplane. Okay, here's a uh, drag due to lift. I'm uh, sorry, drag at zero lift, CDL, okay, for a very, uh, various airflows. And, and you can see that versus Mach number. And so uh, uh, Luke, um, <coughs> Albert Vitz's test <coughs> was using a 12% airfoil right here at Mach 0.8, which would have put him right here. Okay. And then the unswept, uh, that was the uh, uh, unswept, the swept wing is going to respond to the Mach number normal to the spar. And that guy's down here at 0.65 Mach number. And so the swept wing, as a result of trying to fly, trying to test at a, at a high transonic Mach number, the 12% airfoil, the swept wing significantly outperformed the unswept wing. Okay, so here we have some early swept wing aircraft, <coughs> an interesting. The ME-262 wing was swept not for aerodynamic, it was swept to manage the CG. Then we have um, the ME-163 rocket plane uh, was swept and twisted for pitch trim. It was not uh, really, not really uh, designed to take advantage of the swept wing research. Nor was the HO-229 once again swept and twisted for, for trim. By the way, this airplane would have been an extraordinarily slow German jet, slowest of all the German jets because it has a fairly thick uh, airflow in the center. So the 1,000 kilometer per hour, <coughs> one of the goals of that airplane would never have been met the injuries it had. The first airplane to implement, for aerodynamic purposes, the sweep concept tested by the Germans was the Saab Tunan. And uh, the Swedes got a hold of a copy of the German report and shared it with the Allies, and the Allies said they were not interested. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the 209 also was first to, uh, to take advantage of area ruling because they, uh, they made sure that the thickest area was right here before the wing. It's hard to see from this photo, but the area, the width of the fuselage shrinks right here at the point of the uh, So it's implementing an area ruling to allow the flag airplane to fly faster. Okay, now we have swept wings. And we have uh, all of these wings, by the way, fall on this curve for the lift slope. Um, this is the Helmholtz-Diedrich curve. Um, we're still subsonic. And then we have, uh, now we're into our lifting line. Okay, so the lifting line, we're going to use, take advantage of the horseshoe vortex. We're going to put about 100 horseshoe vortices. This is a half of a wing here. 100 horseshoe vortices plastered all over the wing and the tail, appanage, and so on the four button and let those calculate, calculate the mutual effects of all those to calculate the aerodynamic loads on the airplane. So the, uh, the boundary condition of that analysis is, is that the flow has to be uh, tangent uh, to, to the uh, cord line of the equivalent flat airfoil, <coughs> right here. So the difference again, we have gamma is the geometric incidence of, of the equivalent flat airfoil, which has to be alpha plus zero. Okay, so there's some, some of the details. Um, and um, let's take a look at some, some results here. So here, we're gonna have, here, here we have a, a combination of a wing and a body. This is NACA data. 
And um, here's here's the uh, here's the wing, okay, that we talked about earlier, okay, and it's developing lift, and it's so that's destabilizing. So the combination of the lift of the wing. Here's the wing, by the way. Here's the test data up here. The calculation is the blue curves, and what they did for this particular model was that they uh, they put pressure taps all over the wing, and then they put pressure taps all over the center body, all where the where the wing passed through the body, if you will, and. Um, so that gave us this test data, which is the red symbols, and the blue curve is the calculation. And this little dome down here is the lift of the full body. Okay? And um, <clears throat> if you want, <clears throat> for study purposes, the designer can take that and tilt the, tilt the nose down at about a 40 degrees, and that will remove that lift altogether because there's an upwash, upwash on the nose on the full body due to the wing. And that will be reflected in the, in the analysis. And this is just one of several designs that are in my Excel file. <clears throat> and the, the nice thing about Excel, this is all programmed in Visual Basic. All of the business functions are at the top of the ribbon of Excel. Not a single one of those is used. I don't even those are completely removed. Those are all business functions. What you want to do is you go to the Visual Basic editor, which is in the background. And the Visual Basic is, is the backbone of programming language of all of, of, all of the uh, many of the Microsoft products, Word, PowerPoint itself. So uh, in this case, the, we find out that the, the neutral point of the airplane, which is represented by this bigger circle, and then I chose to put the CG arbitrarily a few percent ahead of that. And this is the distribution of lift, distribution of drag, distribution of upwash. Uh, let's take a look at the, at, the, at the upwash. The angle of attack is four and a half degrees, and the calculation shows that the upwash is minus four and a half degrees at the wing tips. This is, this is the span. So why is that? Well, what's happening now is that, is that we know that the lift vanishes at the wing tip. So, so if the airplane is at four degrees angle of attack, the flow approaching the absolute wing tip is actually at minus four degree incidence, and the lift vanishes at, at the wing tip. So the upwash, which is the opposite of downwash, is equal to the negative of the angle of attack right at the wing tips. Okay. So the wing body, the combination of wing and body lift calculation, the distribution of those has, has been calculated and demonstrated here to matching test data. And uh, let's take a look at another example. This is the, uh, this is the Saab Vigan. Uh, beautiful airplane, 67, 1967 vintage. Um, if you look carefully, you can see some leading edge droop here, which is good because when you have a thin airfoil, this has to have a thin airfoil to fly fast. And so when you have a thin airfoil, um, you want to have a uh, Leading edge, a little bit of leading edge droop or some leading edge flaps uh, when you get to uh, above four degrees angle of attack. How do slats affect leading edge slats? I don't know how leading edge slats would have any effect, but uh, this is just using some a little bit of leading edge camber, and the same thing was used on the Vulcan, uh, Vulcan bomber. Okay, so let's do a calculation here. So we're calculating the lift distribution on the full body, the canard, and the wing. And the red lines are the lifting line and the downwash line. And um, the, um, the lifting line, by the way, has an empirical adjustment for transonic effects. As we fly faster, faster transonically, that lifting line is empirically moved back to reflect uh, uh, data. And the, uh, the downwash line, which is, so this is nominally at 25% cord, and this is nominally at 75% cord, but the two of those have been shifted back because this particular airplane is being flown at Mach 0.9. So here we are at Mark 0.9, and uh, here's the calculation of the blue curves, the, the blue, the big, this curve is the distribution of lift over the wing, and it's not elliptical by any means because the canard, which is almost elliptical, the canard is generating a tremendous amount of downwash on the inboard, inboard portion of the wing. Okay. So here we have the lift of the forebody, the lift of the canard, which is almost elliptical, and the lift of the wing, which has a significant dip in, in the middle. And this is the distribution of, of, of drag, um, sweep, incidence, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the calculated lift to drag ratio for this airplane in this condition is around 11.5. Okay. okay, wing lifts. This happened to be flying over 4th of July over, over the San Pedro, flew right over my house. C-17. Um, here's an example of a NASA test data with and without winglets. So we're going to apply the method here. 
and we're looking at the distribution of lift uh, over the wing with, uh, with no winglets. And you get almost, we get almost an elliptical uh, curve here. Here's the calculation, here's the data, excellent match. Um, the, uh, the integral of this particular curve here of the non-dimensional lift distribution has to be area, the area of that curve has to be one. Okay, and we got uh, for this particular airplane at this particular Mach number, we got an L over D of 20.4. Let's now add the winglets. There's the winglets now that have been added. And what happened to L over D went to 20.2. Whoops. <laughs> L over D gave me a doubt. At first I thought that result was incorrect, but then I realized that there's a lot of things happening that result is correct. This is a very small winglet. If you look pretty carefully here, the winglet is pretty small. <coughs> and um, there's a sudden reduction of, of cord. And here's the calculation and the data once again. So the blue line is the calculation. And of course the lift continues um, on, on the wing. <coughs> you have a winglet. The lift continues all along the wing, and then continues out on the winglet. Okay, but the lift on the winglet will point inboard. I'm calling it lift, it's a normal force, if you will. So the lift continues all the way out and then vanishes at the wing tip, at the winglet tip, excuse me. And we're, we're matching the data. But what's happening here is that this is not an optimized winglet. And so when you, when you put a suboptimal, when you add a suboptimal winglet to a, to a wing which has already been near optimal, because let's do a like, look at the original wing, it was almost an elliptical distribution, which was pretty darn good. This is about as good as you could get. Al Bowers may disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, if, you, if you want a bell shaped distribution of lift, and by the way, this airplane would have to have about 10 degrees of washout at the tips to, to get that. Uh, and that's, that's all about the minute bending moment discussion. But what's happening about bending moment here? Okay, so the winglets, if you were to design a brand new wing, a, design a brand new wing with a certain span or constraint, and taking into, into, into account multidisciplinary optimization, structures, weight, aerodynamics, you probably will not emerge with a winglet. Winglets that you see out there today are ubiquitous, all on the commercial airplanes. Those winglets are all add-ons. Okay, the wing was designed long ago. Those winglets were added on to get an additional 2% fuel economy. The structural guys were pressured, pushed against the wall, and said, can you take the extra bending moment? And they said, yes, of course, you can do it. So they were pressured, they were, they were pressured to accept the additional bending moment because they had the extra margin available and your plane is still safe. But when you design a brand new airplane, you're not gonna end up, not likely to emerge with a winglet as part of the design. And that's, we'll see that in a second. Okay, actually a little bit, about five minutes from now. I'm actually on schedule here. Okay, apparent, apparent upwash method. Okay. So now let's revisit Prentzel's, uh, this looks very similar to before, but this is now the drag. This is the drag of, of the of the, of the wing. And once again, the Prentzel's calculation is the solid line. And once again, the test data for two elliptical wings is 10% higher. So the, the drag with Prentzel's seal squared over pi A formulation was 10% optimistic. Nevertheless, we are indebted to Prentzel for the first approximate understanding of how to lift the drag works and what's the effect of the shape of the wing. So the, uh, the remainder of the analysis here for the drag is going to try to get closer to, to, to those uh, symbols. Okay. <clears throat> so but notice, notice that by plotting the square lift coefficient, you get a straight line. Okay. So here we have, once again, now we're, now we're doing the same diagram that we had before. That the key thing that I want you to see without falling asleep, if you can stay awake for this one feature, boom, right there, stay awake for that one feature. This is upwash. So in three-dimensional flow, all of the surfaces act together, and some of them generate downwash and other surfaces, and some generate upwash. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> inboard portion of the wing is going to see downwash, uh, tail is going to see downwash, but the forebody, We'll see upwash because it's up at front of the wing. Canard, I'm sorry, uh, uh, a winglet. A winglet is typically going to see upwash. Okay, uh, a canard will typically see upwash. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to call that angle epsilon. <clears throat> is the upwash angle. <clears throat> so now the aerodynamics just have to include not only the geometric incidence of the airfoil, but now the upwash that has been caused by interacting with other uh, airfoil uh, sections throughout the whole airplane. The bottom line is that now what that does is that tilts the, uh, the that tilts the normal force vector, and if we have uh, if we have positive upwash, 
Okay, there's our drag from before, excuse me. And there's, if we have positive upwash, this, this normal force, this pressure integration vector actually tilts forward. That's according to Prandtl's uh, guidance. And uh, that actually generates from thrust for us. So if you have a thick airfoil and it, it, is, it is an upwash field, that vector leans forward, you only get a little bit of thrust, and that's how, that's how an, a winglet works. Okay, but if we have a uh, uh, thinner airfoil, we're not going to get that. Uh, we're not going to be able to take advantage of that. <coughs> okay. So for a thick foil, upwash reduces the drag. And this is going to be fundamentally included in, uh, as, together with our, our, uh, our two-dimensional drag due to lift that we talked about earlier in the presentation is, at, is the first term. The second term now is the effect of upwash. <coughs> so, we, so we start, if you will, with a vertical vector, assuming that everything is perfectly great. We tilt aft for, for this uh, uh, drag due to lift in two dimensions. And then we tilt forward for this drag due to lift in three dimensions. And here's our first example, testing the method. And this is our induced drag for a elliptical wing. And um, I promise I did not, I did not massage the data. I was very delighted to see this, <laughs> this level of group. We won't see this level on the next, on the next few charts. Not as good, but I was taken aback by how good the, the agreement uh, with this method we've tested it for elliptical wing. Okay, so here's uh, now. One thing that I want you to see here, here's the CL squared over pi A. The dashed green line is Prantl's pure formulation for just the drag due to lift of the elliptical wing. Now we have to add the profile drag of the NACA 12 section. How many people have a copy of Abbott and Dovenhoff, the blue book on airfoils? Okay, in that, in that you can go and look at the NACA 0012, and you will see that it is almost a parabola, okay, as we talked about earlier. So this was a classic example. The NACA 12 is a classic application for these methods because it is parabolic drag versus CL versus CD. So when we go to Na uh, Abbott and Dovenhoff and add the drag in the lift of the NACA 12, we get the, the dashed orange curve. You can see that the dashed orange curve, so the traditional methodology is still 10% optimistic. Okay? With the new method that I've just described to you, um, we, can, we can pass to the data for this particular, at least for this particular example. Okay, so let's look at some realistic other examples. Now here we have a swept wing, untwisted, uh, no camber. The data, the agreement was decent uh, between the calculation, which is the red curve, and the symbols, which are the blue curve. Now we're going to more, we're going to progressively challenge the method with more and more difficulty. Let's now twist and camber the wing. So now this guy, uh, now the wing is swept, and it's, it's using a cambered section. <coughs> when I'm using a cambered section, what am I doing for thickness? I'm, as a first approximation, I'm using one half of the upper half thickness to represent the equivalent, the effective thickness of the, of the, uh, of the airfoil. So that, that means that like you have a transonic airfoil, like a Boeing 727, 737, Mach 0.8, they use a, uh, they can actually get by with a 13% thick airfoil at the root of the wing by cambering uh, the forward portion of the airfoil is actually inverted camber, okay? Now let's take a look at the top. The top of the airfoil is, is uh, got almost none of that, very, very little. The top of the airfoil is like the equivalent of a 6% maybe thick airfoil, okay? So, so using this method, if I were modeling a Boeing 787 or 727 type transport, I would not be sticking in 13% thickness. I would stick in 6% thickness because the, the upper, not the lower one, it's the upper one that's driving the physics that we're describing here. So twice the upper half thickness if you have camber uh, in the airfoil. Okay, and then last but not least, we have a delta wing. This is the most difficult, this is difficult to match because the delta wing is going to have a nonlinear lift curve, uh, nonlinear uh, features that are not picked up uh, by the method. Uh, we could have added an empirical effect, uh, but there is no such thing right now in, in the model. Is that also a cambered wing? This, thank you, this is, this is a symmetrical, flat, symmetrical, sharp, sharp nose uh, wing. No twist, no camber. Okay, so we showed that the method obtains a decent, an excellent match in some cases, a decent match in others, um, and we know where the, where the method can get into trouble with a with really low aspect ratio uh, wing. Okay, so here we have, now I'm going to do a little bit more, eat more, a little bit more fun stuff. Um, these guys, my wife and I were traveling across the Arizona California border. We went through the, we passed through the uh, Cibola Nature Reserve, and I was delighted to see a group of white pelicans all spiraling and, and lifting in a thermal. Mm -hmm. And I said, stop, stop, stop. And I had my wife pull over. 
<laughs> and there's cars behind us and we had to pull over and stop. And that, we found a safe place to do that finally and I got out and by the time I had done that, they had lined up into this formation. <clears throat> okay. How many people think that the lead bird actually enjoys an advantage of being in formation relative to flying solo? I going to see a show of hands. How many people think the lead bird actually will enjoy a benefit of formation flight relative to flying solo? Any, any takers? Ooh, that's my sit level versus to have to be ambient pressure. No takers? Come on. Show a handful, a handful of brave people who are correct. Seems like it's too far away. Okay. How did we get that result? Okay. This bird actually enjoys an advantage, but his, uh, his partners actually get more of an advantage, but he's getting an advantage. Let's see why. What we're going to do is we're going to put the horseshoe vortex uh, on, the, uh, on the wing of, the, of, the, of this wingman. This is the wingman. So here's our horseshoe vortex. And um, <coughs> the, uh, the bound portion of the, um, of the horseshoe vortex is generating upwash on anything ahead of it. And so that's generating upwash. You can't, it's really hard to visualize in this angle. But he's generating upwash on the bird up in front, he or she. The uh, trailing portion of the uh, of the horseshoe vortex is actually generating is uh, generating upwash for anything outboard of his or her wingtip. So anything outboard of his wingtip, which is this guy, even though he's up front, <coughs> is going to see some upwash from that leg of the of the vortex. This one over here, the third the third leg is going to have a very small effect. Okay. So what we find is that if you run, I did I spared you the details here, but I actually ran this through the computer model. <coughs> Instead of a wing and a tail, I put in five helicans in, in position, and it turns. And the LRB, uh, the calculations are all normalized to the wing, to the first wing that you enter. So everything was calculated normalized to the wing area of the first bird. It turns out that the LRB of the entire package, the LRB of the whole team, was enhanced by nine percent as a result of a formation flight. It turns out that the followers got to enjoy a ten percent reduction of drag, and that the leader. Uh, uh, a 2% reduction of drag. So he enjoyed, he or she enjoyed a small benefit of the information. So we can learn from nature. Would that apply to a multi-slotted wing then? Well, the, uh, the pelican like many, many of the soaring birds has what, what it looks like, looks like at least five, uh, five uh, fingerlets. I don't know what they're called. Out now, bowers, what do we call those? We, uh, sure. <laughs> I don't study those kind of birds. It's an interesting aspect of those feathers. If you look at the leading, the leading feather may be typically maybe maybe tilted nose down 30 degrees. The leading feather. Okay, so learning from the pelicans now. Let, uh, uh, from the brown pelicans now. Let's learn from the uh, a white pelican. Excuse me. Now we have a brown pelican. This is photographed in San Pedro where I live. And um, in ground effect, uh, once again, uh, I ran the model with, uh, I'm sparing you the details, but I ran the model, I put one bird above the water, and then it turns out that Albert Betts told us, showed, us, showed us about 19, in the early 19, that, that the, uh, in, in, in ground effect, we have a mirror image of our aircraft under the ground at the same height with a complete mirror image. And um, this is Albert Betts. So here's my wing, I'm going to do an example with a wing and a tail here, and a wing and a tail here. Everything underground, mirror image. And um, we have the horseshoe vortex on the upper wing, looks like that. So that means that the horseshoe vortex is opposite on the, on the wing underneath. And we get some interesting effects. One interesting effect is that the bound vortex of the inverted wing is generating stream wash, a negative stream wash, on the aircraft above. And that means that the, the airspeed will not match ground speed. You cannot have the airplane roll on the ground and try to calibrate airspeed to match the ground speed of a truck that's driving alongside with you because the airspeed and ground speed are not the same because of, the, of this uh, effect. And then, of course, we have the, tail, the, the trailing portion generating upwash. And so this guy's generating upwash that you see right here. And this last one over here is generating upwash at the same position. And so we have upwash, 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 and we also get upwash on the tail. So there's a nose down effect, nose down moment that's caused by ground effect. How many people here flying pilot, flying gliders when you get into, get into ground effect have perceived the nose down pitching moment? I don't know. Oh, there we go. So Sanya, among others. Okay. <coughs> okay. So um, 
So remember when I told you that a new design is not going to emerge with a winglet, not likely to emerge, and this is a new design, this is the Boeing, uh, and it's using basically it's using a raked wing tip. And since I'm giving you the presentation here, I'm going to have to, to flip through that, but here's the calculation. And uh, one thing I want you to see is the drag, the drag on the on the raked wing tips right here and here, even though they are even though they're essentially have almost no dihedral, is a negative drag of minus 0.02 is the drag coefficient on those uh, raked wing tips. And that's what you see on Boeing 787 today. It's very much like that. Okay, uh, here's the calculation for a joined wing. And I'm not going to spend the details because you can go to my website to look over that. But uh, the, it turns out that the L over D for this airplane was within, a, within, the, within the noise, the same L over D as the airplane I just showed earlier. Those are both two advanced designs that NASA has been studying for advanced commercial transport. And uh, we're going to finish up here with, uh, I think I have just two minutes real quickly. Great. Uh, okay, and I'm running, in the last one minute here, this is a, uh, a uh, completely math model, mathematical model design of a new configuration intended for electric flight. These uh, bla uh, blades are, are spinning at very low RPM, 500 RPM, allowing us to keep the tip Mach number subsonic. Throughout. And the airplane is intended to fly Mach 0.7. It's called Faraday First in honor of Michael Faraday. Intended to represent notionally the first airplane to fly Mach 0.7 on all electric flight. If you look very carefully at the left hand winglet, we're going to do a flight control track. The airplane flies by differential or symmetric act, uh, activity of the winglets on a swept wing. Because we talked about how the lift is distributed constantly. Okay, so if you change the lift on the winglet, you change the lift on the wing. So you can roll the airplane and you can pitch the airplane. And here we are. This was uh, animated, animated for me by my uh, good friend Mario Marino computer graphic artist. Uh, I gave him the model. The model is completely mathematical. The model from wingtip to wingtip and with the Python equations within Blender. Blender.org is a free uh, computer graphic software. I highly recommend it. It's a European, a Dutch product, but it's all programmed in English. Here we're flying at Mach 0.7. We're doing some turning. We just turned with the winglet. Now we're uh, flying Mach 0.7 as, as the Mach 0.8 commercial airplane flies by. <laughs> and so admittedly, we're flying a little slower, but we're putting out a lot less global warming yeah, that guy. Got okay, and here we're coming in for our landing. Is this battery powered? Or? This is this would be this would be battery powered. Yes, indeed. Yes. So this is this is it. Sometime in the future. This is um, this is going to be twenty years in the future. Okay, that concludes the presentation. <laughs>